Hello everybody and welcome. My name is Professor Rich and today we are talking about useful phrases in the context of university. If you're joining me from Oxford Online English, we were just talking about the phonemic chart in the context of university and I'd like to welcome you all right now to our lovely, lovely stream. Good to see everyone in the chats. Hello, Tamara. Nice of you to join me and nice of you to take part in the Q&A, Pallavi. It's the first time I've used that feature and I don't know if it was particularly useful at all, really. I have no idea if that's a useful feature. I will have to try that in the future. So, university, university, discuss. We're going to discuss university. We're going to consider important soft skills in seminars. So, what is a soft skill? And what is a seminar, you might say? And I might say as well. So, can you type there in the chat? What do you think? What do you think is a soft skill? And what's a seminar? Then we're going to learn some useful phrases for seminar discussions. And finally, we'll do some practice. Now, I do apologize if I'm flying by the seat of my pants a little. But for some reason, even though I started planning my classes at half past nine this morning, I've been behind schedule all day. And then I destroyed myself in a nasty workout and now I'm trying to recover. So, okay. So Zoya says, soft skills are the ability to communicate well. Can you give an example of a soft skill, Zoya? To start us off. And then I'm going to give you some questions. Okay, first question. What's the best thing about university? Answers in the chat. What's the best thing about university? What's the best thing about university? I feel like I'm a bit small and I kind of want to be bigger. <laughs> On the stream. I made it smaller to get more room but i don't know does that work for you what do you think am i too small now <laughs> so zoya says the best thing about university is getting drunk with peers palavi says it's bigger than college that's the best thing about university <laughs> is that the best thing about university that it's bigger than college Daisy says, I think the best thing about university is no one cares if you play truant. So play truant, playing truant, which as we learned before, play truant means skip class. Now, actually, Daisy, it does depend. Some universities punish you quite badly for that. For example, they you can fail the course if you miss a number of lectures. Kashata says, one of the best things is the freedom, but only if used wisely. Yeah, well, it, the idea there is to kind of prepare you for the real life. But actually, I think that teachers at university are very lazy, a lot of them. Lecturers, professors, whatever, they normally don't have excellent teaching skills. So Pavia says, soft skills are about the way one behaves. Something like that. Ah, almost really happened, says. The best thing about university is the possibility of doing an interchange abroad. That sounds great. Domenico says, when I was studying at university, you were allowed to miss just a few lectures. It really does depend on the university and the course. Actually, I think normally it's the course director who determines that. Okay, next question. 
What's the difference between a lecture and a seminar? I was going to use the Q and A function, but I don't really like it. I think it needs a better implementation. Manuel says, here in Tenerife, university has 10 buildings for different degrees. Ah, Daisy only goes in class when there's a roll call. So a roll call. Um, in British English, we use roll call for the military and for prison. Um, but the US, they kind of can use that a bit more generally. But in British English, we would say taking the register. So Daisy only goes to class when the teacher is taking a register. So almost really happens, says, I think in seminars, everybody talks. Kind of. Anawat says seminars is like a group discussion, discusses p particular topics. That's right. So what soft skills are important in a seminar? A seminar, seminar is often uh, working in small groups, uh, discussing ideas on the course. That's a seminar. So it's a lecture. You have hundreds of students maybe. But in a seminar, normally maybe maximum 20, 25. And normally you'll work in groups of maybe four three or four students in a group. A lecture is one-way traffic as opposed to a seminar, says uh, Brittany. I'm going to call you Brittany. Um, yeah, that's right. Lecture is kind of a lecturer and a lecture. We call it a sage on the stage. So we have the wise, all-powerful lecturer who stands up and talks at a big room of students. One-way traffic. Sometimes there's two-way traffic, but not much. Pallavi says, I'd never attended a seminar. Seminars tend to happen at university. Are you at university, Pallavi? Or college? In college, there's not so much. Because in college, really, you have classes that are basically seminars anyway. But in university, you need seminars to support your learning of the lecture. So Zoya is saying communicating politely and analytical thinking. Yes, I, I agree with both of those. And when I was at university, I wasn't very good at communicating politely. That was a problem for me. Actually, I wasn't very good at communicating at all, but certainly not politely. It's one of those things that they teach in private schools. You have lots of money, you go to a private school, and they teach you those kind of soft skills. But I went to a scummy state school, so nobody taught me how to communicate politely i had to learn myself but okay 15 years of language teaching i think i have a, a good idea now so i'm going to show you a list of soft skills and i want you to tell me which of these soft skills do you think are most important in a seminar and why you can have a look at that list of soft skills there and tell me which of those soft skills do you think are most important in a university seminar and why? And also, can you think of any others? Are there any other soft skills which might be important in a sort of group discussion? So we're talking about this sort of thing. I like how I can disappear now and there's still the colour thing. I quite like that. 
So a lot of people are saying, expressing ideas clearly. Can you justify that opinion? So why? What is so important about that? Why is that more important? And why are the other things not so important? So I really should say, which of these are most important and why? <laughs> Higher order question. What are those? What are what? Are what? what are what Pallavi? These are soft skills. Ah, what is paraphrasing? Yeah, that's an interesting one. So paraphrasing is when you need to say something in another way. And that's a useful skill for anyone, but it's especially a useful skill for expressing yourself as a non-native speaker and for when you're talking to non-native speakers but also when you're talking to native speakers. So it's when you need to say something in another way. It's a critical part of communication. Okay, and there's these kind of grammar versions of paraphrasing that we teach, which is where you say stuff like, oh, it's a man who rescues people from fires. A fireman, right? Or it's a thing you use to cut paper scissors or something right that's one way of paraphrasing but actually paraphrasing just means you say something another way okay so i can say my cat jumped on my desk or i can say one of my pets leaped up onto my work surface <laughs> right so there's different ways of saying the same thing. That's paraphrasing. And it's a really important skill. You don't want to learn this in a robotic way. Learn it in a natural communicative way to re-express an idea. So let's see some of the ideas in the chat now. Nipa Begum says different people have different ideas and their opinions and we have to express them. We have to respect them only when they are not wrong. Wait a minute, Nipa. Wait, we have to respect them only when they're not wrong? Really? Can we respect them when they are wrong as well? Uh, Manuel says expressing ideas clearly. Why? Because if you start talking about law and turning it into a racial class, then you're not expressing your ideas clearly, I guess is what you mean there. Uh, Katarina says critical thinking for me is important. It helps go beyond boundaries. You have to analyze, listen, weigh pros and cons. Yes, Ekaterina. And I think today we seem to really lack critical thinking. So many people listen to what the idiot box or the television says to them and they just believe it. Where's the critical thinking? I think critical thinking is so important now. So important. And if you go to university... And someone discourages you from critical thinking. I think that's a big problem. And that I had that experience. I had that experience studying applied linguistics. I had the experience of a lecturer discouraging me from questioning the material. That should never be, that should never be a thing. Daisy says, I think expressing ideas clearly is more important because... You don't want to create unnecessary misunderstanding. Yeah, and actually expressing ideas clearly is really difficult. Really difficult. Um, and then Brittany says, offering sound arguments. An argument becomes one if it's well argued presented. Failing that, it's an opinion not backed up by facts. A sound argument doesn't need facts, by the way. Um, it just needs to be justified. 
you want to learn a bit of logic? Does anyone want to learn a bit of logic? Am I overstepping my role as an English teacher here? I'll teach you some logic. This is uh, Prof. Rich. Logic 101. So, all of you guys who are starting at university or going to university for, uh, soon, logic is a very interesting topic to look at. So, I'm just going to give you the outline of, of, of this, this idea of logic and arguments. And we have in logic, we have this thing called modus ponens. That's Latin. Okay. Modus ponens is widely considered to be the most simple form of a valid argument. Now, a valid argument is one that is logically correct. Okay. And modus ponens is simply like this. We say, if, if A, then B. A is true, therefore B. Okay, so that, that is modus ponens, right? So I can say, for example, if it rains, then the ground gets wet. Then I say, it is raining, therefore the ground will get wet. Okay, so that's a, that's a modus ponens, right? Another example, if I eat too much salt, I get thirsty. I just ate too much salt, therefore I will get thirsty. Okay, so again, there's a, there's a modus ponens. So this is, this is a simple form of argument, okay? Now, when an argument follows a correct logical structure we call it a valid argument and if we have a valid argument where the premises are true in this case the premises is a then we call that a sound argument okay there you go, logic 101. So if you're going to university to make arguments, then knowing a bit about logic can really help you. You can probably find a simple video somewhere on YouTube which will talk you through that. Okay, so that's modus ponens. Uh, what's that, Nipa? What did you say? Uh, by wrong, I meant when they are on the topic. On the, you mean off topic, Nipa? Palavi says, I have to go to study for my exams. I know. I'm sorry. I'm distracting you. Get studying, Palavi. Come on. Let's do it. Yeah, I, I, personally, I personally think, Nipa, that it's difficult to say what is wrong. So, therefore, you kind of need to respect everyone's opinion. Even if you think it's wrong, you can respect it. And then you can say, by the way, you're wrong. <laughs> I respect your opinion. By the way, you're wrong. So we're going to have a discussion in the chat. All right. Are you ready for this? This is a university seminar and I want to see what language you can use. I will be highlighting any excellent language that you use in the chat. And also I will provide corrections when needed. So number one, the English that people speak in 2050 will be massively diff different than today's English. Do you agree or disagree? Could you type your opinion in the chat? And let's see how you express your opinion and interact with other people. So the English people speak in 2050 will be massively different than today's English. I'm keeping the cap.
Actually, no, I'm not going to do that. I'll do it like that. Okay. Expressing ideas clearly is of paramount importance. As everyone is to be understood, your point coming across clear in the air. Come on, Palava, you've got to get to work. You're, pro you're procrastinating. And I'm enabling your procrastination. That's not good. So Tamaris says, I disagree. It'll be different, but not massively. All right. That's your opinion. Where's your argument? I think we need a bit more there, Nipa. You're saying, oh, I think it'll be that. No, I'm sorry, not Nipa. Zoya. Uh, I think it'll be slightly different because languages are alive and changing, but not massively different. I need a bit more, I think, Zoya. By the way, Zoya, thank you for your homework submission. It's very good. And we'll look at that probably tomorrow. Maybe Monday. Depends. Kind of busy at the moment. Daisy says, Rich, may I ask, how can you say whether the opinion is wrong or not? It's ambiguous. Something wrong does not mean it's not right in another culture. Um, okay, so Daisy, my point was, you should respect all opinions, even if you think it's wrong. I'm not talking about objectively wrong. Actually, I think it's very difficult to say that something is objectively right or wrong. I think you can only argue from perspective and attempt. I mean, it's the job of all of us to try to find the truth, whatever the truth is. But I think it's not for one person to say this is true, this isn't true. So, whatever point you're making, I kind of agree with it. However, I do think from a personal perspective, you can say, I think that's wrong, because that's just another opinion, right? I think that's wrong because blah, 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 blah. Well, I think that's wrong because blah, 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 right? That's the conversation. But I am very much on the side of listening to all opinions, Right. And um, my favorite example of this, this is very controversial. My favorite example of this is Christopher Hitchens defending the right of Holocaust deniers in Austria to publish a book saying that the Holocaust didn't happen. I'm not saying that that book was a good idea but I'm saying that it was very brave of Christopher Hitchens to defend that. He didn't agree with it, but he defended that it should be allowed because actually it wasn't allowed. And the people who wrote it went to jail for a long time in Austria for writing a book. So there you go. I'm very much on the side of free speech and... Um, people being allowed to express whatever opinion. So, Anawat agrees. People from around the world tend to migrate to English more than the past decade. There might be a weird dialect in the future that's totally different from these days. Yes. It's difficult to think that far ahead, but language is constantly evolving. I like that. So it would be safe to assume that's going to be the case. Very good. Daisy says, do you mean going to jail because of spreading a conspiracy theory? It wasn't because they were spreading a conspiracy theory. It's specifically because they denied the Holocaust, which is specifically against the law in Austria and Germany. So other conspiracy theories are OK, but that specific one sent them to jail. And whether they're spreading it or not is a matter of debate. They wrote a book. 
you don't have to believe what someone writes in a book. You don't even have to read it. But I tell you what, if someone goes to jail for writing a book, I bet you that more people will read it. So actually, maybe the Austrian government are the ones who are responsible for spreading that conspiracy theory by putting those people in jail. Maybe now they need to put themselves in jail for being responsible for spreading that, spreading knowledge of that or spreading the word of that event. How about that? <laughs> um, I'm, a, I'm a free speech absolutist. So Manuel says, English is a multicultural country with a mix of language. So finally, English will borrow a lot of words from other languages. It already does borrow a lot of words. I mean, another interesting question is how will English affect other languages? Okay, everybody, let's move on to the next topic. Thank you very much for that. So the next topic is there's nothing to gain from reading books older than 50 years. There's nothing to gain from reading books older older than 50 years what do you think about that dr archu hey rich how are you it's my birthday hey happy birthday happy birthday dr archu how do we can I do like a thing? I don't know how to do a thing. I need like fire, <laughs> fireworks or something. How do I do the thing? <laughs> Can anyone help me here? Hang on. Uh, sorry, Dr. Archie, but I don't know how I can uh, do a thing here. Uh, what about this? There we go. Okay, happy birthday to Dr. Archu. I'm not going to sing happy birthday, sorry. <laughs> if we were in class, I would have to, and all the students would sing it, but I'm not going to do that on stream. Uh, can I put, like, some text up on top of that? This is getting too complicated. Okay, get rid of the cat. Get rid of the cat. Okay, I'm destroying the stream to wish someone happy birthday. Fantastic. Yes, remove dancing cat. Okay, so happy birthday. We are discussing there's nothing to gain from reading books older than 50 years old. And I will highlight interesting language in the chat. Totally disagree. As in most of the literature... Literary treasures date back to the days gone by. Ooh, literary treasures. L lit literary, literary treasures. Nice. Don't know where you're getting this fantastic vocabulary from, but it's wonderful. Zoya says, there's always something to gain from reading books. Unfortunately, people read less and less. Yeah, tell me about it. I read less and less as well. That's okay, Pallavi, but maybe you can study and have the stream in the background. That's okay. You can do that. But you need to open that book and do a bit of studying. It's important. So Tamira says, books that are older can teach you something about that time, but knowledge may have changed and evolved. I am neutral. Okay. Katarina says, I think 50 years still makes sense. Not older. Depends on the purpose of reading. If you're a linguist, it is reasonable for reading. If you're a historian or other profession and pursue some professional advantage reading it, it's okay. But for English learners, it would be better to read contemporary literature. That's a really interesting point, Ekaterina. And I, I think you do have kind of a point there. 
where for for people learning English, it might be better to read contemporary literature. I know that Pavia might disagree with that, and um, I would dis I would say there are some exceptions, such as the great Sherlock Holmes, which is just fantastic and is over one hundred years old. Really good, really well worth reading for any English learner. However, perhaps Great Expectations or Shakespeare is not really necessary for someone who wants to speak the language today. Pavia says, books older than 50 years offer invaluable insights. Invaluable insights, lovely. Into the historical context and social norms lovely i like that historical context and social norms and cultural perspectives of their time enhancing our understanding of human progress and evolution wonderful by the way everybody smash that like button smash that like button we need that like button smash the like button thank you very much Julia says, I beg to differ. There will definitely be a thing or two of some knowledge of vocabularies. Some, sorry, Julia, I've lost you there. Can you rephrase that? The English exam is difficult for me to understand, says Pallavi. Um, have you tried practicing past exams? That's always a good way to get an idea of what you need to know. Daisy says 101 means showing the basic knowledge like boiling eggs is cooking 101. Nice explanation, Daisy. Pavia says, moreover, classics and timeless literature continue to be relevant as they address universal themes and enduring human emotions that transcend time. OK, that language is a bit too fancy, so I'm not going <laughs> to not going to write that. OK, great. Let's move on to our next topic. Um, do you want to talk about that? Let me see. What have we got? Choose one of these. Ooh, let's do emojis. Emojis are part of any language, are part of language, and they should be acceptable in writing. Emojis are part of language, and they should be acceptable in writing. Emojis are part of language and they should be acceptable in writing. So discuss in the chat. Do you agree or disagree? And I will highlight any excellent language used. Oh, I like that. I beg to differ. We're getting a bit fancy, aren't we? I beg to differ. I beg to differ. It's a very, very, very fancy language there. I mean, I, I personally wouldn't say it uh, a lot, but a uh, lovely phrase. I beg to differ. There will be a meaningful contributions to enchance, enhance your vocabulary in some way. Oh, you mean that reading older books still has a benefit for language learners? Okay. So Manuel says, I disagree. Using emojis makes your communication silly. Turn that off now. Pallavi says, the questions come always differently, although I haven't seen last year's questions. I don't understand heroic poetry and some theories that are given by ancient writers. Mm, yeah, sounds tough, Pallavi. That's literature that you're doing there, isn't it? Not language. That's uh, that's Pavia's speciality. Vladimir adds that emojis are widely used to express emotions. And Zoya says, I totally agree that emojis are part of language, but they should only be part of informal language. Hmm. 
Emojis work well in private chats, but not in serious texts. What's the problem? What happens if you use emojis in serious text? Do you think we might have stories soon in the future where people use emojis in a story, in a novel? Pavia says, emojis are acceptable in writing, especially in informal or digital communication contexts. Emojis add emotional nuance. Nuance. I love the word nuance. Yeah. I, I love the word nuance. I also love the word subtleties. Which is basically another word for nuance. Nuance and subtleties meaning small but important differences in meaning. Yes, teacher, that's literature, says Pallavi, who's cleverly using a an emoji. Daisy says, I bet the literature teachers would have a migraine after reading my essay filled with emojis. Could be interesting, though. Manuel says, one thing is to put a thumb up, and another one is 24 emojis with loads of expressions. <laughs> Pavia says, however, their appropriateness should be considered based on the context and audience to maintain clarity and professionalism in formal situations. Hmm. Julia says emojis likely bring a disadvantage to your critical thinking skills. I'm not quite sure what you mean with that, Julia. Honestly, I'm not very good at emojis. <clears throat> so I use ChatGPT to generate emojis for me. ChatGPT is an expert at generating emojis, actually. ChatGPT is an, a mega expert of generating emojis. Do we have anyone in the chat who likes chicken kima? Recently, I've been making chicken kima. Yes, that's right. I can cook chicken kima. Do we have anyone who likes chicken kima? I would show you a picture, but it tastes better than it looks. Tanya, hey. Hello, Rich. Hello, everyone. I partly agree. Emojis really became a part of the language, but if we're going to use them everywhere, they could kill literature. Hmm. Nice to see you, Tanya. Tanya joined us in the first uh, conversation club. Manuel says, so instead of speaking out, you put an emoji with an expression. I think emojis can add I I important information, but also they are very ambiguous, aren't they? Like, let's say I do an emoji, right? Let's say I use, hang on. I'm going to use this emoji. Oh, that doesn't work. All right, whatever. Let's just take those two, right? Look at those emojis. Now, without context, what does that mean? Could mean anything, <laughs> right? Does the black heart mean hate? Or does it mean some alternative version of love? Or does it just mean love? And is this, what is this? Is this happiness, joy, smugness? <laughs> right, so, you know, there's, there's some ambiguity there, just like with words, I guess. All right, next topic. What have we got? Oh, let's go for this one. English is where it is today, mainly because of the evil British Empire. Oh, yes. English is where it is today, mainly because of the evil British Empire. Do you know that song? Soldier, soldier, won't you marry me? English is where it is today, mainly because of the evil British Empire. That's actually a really rubbish map. Let's get some a different one. There we go. The evil British Empire, everybody. 
Okay, so English is where it is today because of the English evil British Empire. What do you think? The Empire writes back, says Vladimir, with an amazing Star Wars reference. This is my surrender emoji when I don't have any other opinion. Uh huh. Is it like is it like sweating brow? What about the American? Well, the American Empire is still going on, isn't it? And besides, American is English, so you know. Zoya totally agrees. Don't have any more of an opinion here about the evil British Empire. If you ever watched Star Wars, all of the uh, the original Star Wars, they're all they're all um, British, <laughs> because uh, yeah, Star Wars is. If you don't know, Star Wars is basically a film about um, the the Americans beating the British. <laughs> I love the film though. Lord Vader. Lord Vader, we can't possibly. <laughs> Do you like using emojis, teacher? I use ChatGPT to generate emojis for me, Pallavi. But I do, I, do, I like how emojis look, but I'm very bad at using them. So basically, I use a translator, which is ChatGPT. Um, English stems from the origins of the British Empire. Ah, Manuel says, absolutely true, but without evil. Why? Because we can't stand, we can't, we can't always be, what can we do? We can't, we can't spend all our time looking at the past. All right, Domenico's got other fish to fry. He needs to get in the zone for a speaking session in 50 minutes. He's going to grab a cup of coffee. Good stuff. So, the British Empire has played a massive part in making English a global language. Yep. So, Ashley Chen says, I partly agree with that. Used to rule and invade different con continents. Shall I, shall I give you a really, really controversial take on this? You want a really, really controversial take? No, I can't do it. I'm not going to get that correct. It's controversial. I'm going to read Pavia. The development of English language has been influenced by a multitude of historical, cultural, and socio-political factors. While the British Empire played a significant role in spreading English, and then there's probably a, an exception coming there. I think the bright side of the British Empire gives us positive consequences about the English language. I have a, an interesting question for you. Can anyone in the chat name an empire which was... Name an empire in the chat which was less evil than the British Empire. And it needs to be an empire with significant global influence. The Spanish Empire. <clears throat> the American Empire. <clears throat> the Roman Empire. The Ottoman Empire. The Carthaginian Empire. The Greek Empire. It wasn't really an empire, but let's call it an empire. Ah, Sanjan says the French Empire. Are you sure? Are you sure about that? <laughs> Pavia says the, the Ottoman Empire. You think they're less evil than the British Empire? Why are you calling the British Empire evil? Just to just to have a discussion, Pavia. How many empires are there? 
Well, there were many throughout history, weren't there? America as an empire was born mainly to the British, due to the British. I'm not so sure about that, Tanya. Um, there's a few factors which caused America to explode economically. And one of those was that they discovered a whole continent of undeveloped land just before the Industrial Revolution. So they were really well placed to make a modern country from nothing. I know there were Native Americans there, but they didn't develop the land. They lived as hunter-gatherers. <laughs> they were sweet people. The French Empire, Napoleon... Okay, we're not going to discuss further. Um, actually, Pavio, I don't think the British Empire was evil. That's my controversial take. I'm kind of um, a bit of a um, a patriot uh, when it comes to things like that. I actually think, I think it personally, I think it's difficult to find a global empire who did more good and less evil than the British Empire, because I think the Romans were a lot worse. And the, the Romans did a lot of good things, right? They built roads, they built walls, they built aqueducts, they taught people stuff, right? But the Romans had a lot of slavery, a lot more slavery than the British Empire. And the thing is about the British Empire is the British Empire just traded slaves. They didn't use them, but the Roman Empire used them and killed them <laughs> and made them fight. And all kinds of horrible things, right? Um, and there's an interesting thing about the history of slavery in the British Empire. The British were the first Western nation to make trading slaves illegal. We did it before everyone else. And then we fought wars with European countries because they didn't agree with that law. Let's think about that. No one ever teaches you that, does it? Uh, it should actually be a point of national pride that the British played a huge part in ending the global slave trade. In my opinion. All right, everybody. So we're going to move on to question time. It's been a very interesting class today, a little bit different than what we normally do. A um, little bit of spicy discussions and... We had some excellent language, you can see there. Be constantly evolving. Lovely. Be safe to assume. Literary treasures, contemporary, contemporary literature, invaluable insights, historical context and social norms. I beg to differ. And I'm open to everyone's opinion on begging to differ about things. Add emotional nuance and subtleties. So, any, does anyone have any questions about English? I'm going to use this terrible YouTube Q&A feature again. Oh, I don't... Do I have the option? How do I... Is it true that the British accent is more difficult to master than American? No. <clears throat> it just depends on you, right? Depends on your native language, depends on your teachers, depends on your background. And these days you get some people who actually sound kind of American and British, right? Like, uh, I know this guy is really controversial, but like Andrew Tate. If you listen to Andrew Tate, this is a guy who is currently facing uh, prosecution in Romania for trafficking or something. But he's a famous internet personality. You listen to Andrew Tate. He has a blended American-British accent. And it's really interesting how blended it is. Like, he'll say something really British, and then he'll sound so American afterwards. And it's just, it's interesting to, to hear that. <clears throat> yes, after this class, we will have conversation class. 
Um, probably going to start a little bit late because I need a bit of a rest and a coffee. And then we'll have a bit of a chat about some of the things that we spoke about today. So we'll be following on with conversation class. It will be free. And we'll see where we go from there. Oh, I didn't give you any homework. Um, so the homework for today, well, I'd like you to reflect on the language you heard today. What were your favorite phrases? Okay, just a bit of reflection. We've also got the homework from last week. You can submit that before tomorrow. And that was a task to find an academic article and record yourself summarizing the article in less than three minutes. Manuel sent me a four minute audio, so he broke the rules. So Manuel, you will get an F and 10 years of detention. Is Andrew Tate good or bad person? Um, that's a controversial topic, Siri, and I don't think I should comment, especially since he's currently involved in a legal issue. Pavia says, today's class was an absolute marvel. I was utterly enamored, captivated by every moment. The teacher's brilliance danced like a celestial ballet, leaving my mind a whirl with inspiration. Okay, Pavia's really um, showing off the fancy language there. Thank you. What should I write more to improve my English skills? What do you mean, Nipa? What should I write more? Um, how about a diary, Nipa? Have you considered writing a diary in English? Thanks for having me, Rich. Yeah, so remember, we do have conversation clubs starting in 10 minutes. That's a free conversation class today on Zoom with other learners from today. And please do use your name from YouTube chat so I know who you are. If you don't use your name from YouTube, then maybe I don't let you in. <laughs> okay, so I need to know who you are. So use your name from uh, YouTube chat. And I'll put the information for that in the thingy. All right, I don't know why this is not working at all. Okay. There you go, that, that link should do it. That's starting in about 10 minutes. Do we have any other questions about English? I sent you an audio teacher. Yes, Zoya, I told you before, I said thank you. Thank you for the audio, I did get it. It's really good. And we'll be looking at those either tomorrow or Monday. What if someone reads that diary, says Pallavi? Well, it doesn't have to be like a saucy diary, Pallavi. It doesn't have to be like spicy topics. Just a nice simple diary. Today I woke up, I felt tired, I had a coffee. I don't know how I was going to get through the day, you know, whatever. It's just a little diary, it's just a bit of fun. Uh, is A-level English difficult? Any tips? Y um, yeah. Yeah. Are you doing A-level English language, Shanze? Yeah, pretty tough. I mean, you're going to have to deal with some interesting words there with A-level English language. It's different than what I teach. Because in A-level English language, rather than learning sort of communication skills, you're focusing on the analytical breakdown of the language. So things like... Um, prose versus poetry and rhyming couplets and stanza and all kinds of things like that. Of course, you do also have your punctuation and your grammar and things like that, but they focus more on kind of the structure of language that allows you to write or construct things in a certain way. To be honest, I think literature is more difficult than language, though. Because obviously for literature, you have to read and analyze and discuss and all kinds. I 
Oh, I used to read, read, write about nightmares. Nightmares in my diary. In my language. Um, yeah, <clears throat> I've actually heard that writing um, about your dreams can be helpful, actually, Pallavi. And if you're having nightmares, um, one thing I've heard is you can draw a picture of the nightmare, but draw yourself as a hero, defeating whatever the bad thing in the nightmare is. Apparently, this can be quite a powerful technique for turning nightmares around, for reversing them. And everyone's enjoying their nicknames in the chat. All right, everybody. So it seems that we are wrapping up. There's no more questions. Join me for Conversation Club. The link's in the chat. And also, I will put the link in our Skype group. And fantastic. I'll see you in a bit. 10 minutes. We'll start in 10 minutes. All right. Have a lovely, lovely weekend. Lovely week. It's good to see you all. Thank you so much for coming. Jesus, I'm so tired. What is wrong with me? All right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Hope it was useful. And let's have an outro, some music. Mm -hmm.